Welcome everyone to this first uh, virtual outreach event um, from McGill here, where we are continuing some of our um, outreach programming for uh, from both the Physics Matters group about outreach more generally, um, as well as um, as well as um, our Astro McGill more Astro focused um, outreach talks. Um, so first, um, just to, for people who aren't familiar with this kind of virtual setup, um, what we're going to do is, as always, people generally have a lot of questions um, about a lot of these most really fascinating topics. Um, what we are going to do today is that for each of our three speakers, whom I'll introduce to you in a second, um, we will have short um, presentations, say five to 10 minute uh, talks with some nice photos about um, astronomy at the South Pole um, and what it's like to be an astronomer uh, at the South Pole. Uh, and following that, um, most of this uh, session will be a question and answer period. Uh, we've received a lot of questions ahead of time, so I will pose those questions to our panelists. Um, and of course, you know, you're going to come up with questions as people are talking. And if you do, um, if you're on Zoom, you can simply uh, ask on the chat, uh, or there's also a Q&A button um, that you can press. Uh, put that there, um, and then I will direct those um, questions. And if you're watching this from Facebook, um, simply comment uh, on Facebook. We have people monitoring those. Um, and they will forward those questions to me, which I will then go on and redirect. Um, so in any case, well, thank you very much for um, joining us again. Um, so our three panelists today, well, first, let me actually introduce myself. I'm Adrian Liu. I'm a uh, professor at the uh, Department of Physics at McGill. Um, and joining me today are three of my colleagues, uh, Professor Cynthia Chang, um, who is uh, also in the Department of Physics and the McGill Space Institute, um, and also uh, two graduate students, uh, McLean Robel, uh, who, who we just, we understand just submitted her master's thesis. So this is a very happy day for McLean. Um, sure <laughs> and, um, and, and Josh Montgomery, who's a PhD student here um, at McGill. Um, and all three of them have um, done a lot of work um, at the South Pole. Um, and so to start off, um, let's have uh, Cynthia give her um, little spiel. So stop sharing this one. And then because of technical difficulties, I'm going to be sharing Cynthia's slides, um, but Cynthia will be the one talking. So. Okay, I'm unmuted now. You are unmuted and um, you should see the, the your slide, right? Uh, it's coming up, I think. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks. All right, well, thanks to everyone out there for tuning in today. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the work that I do. Um, so my name is Cynthia and I'm a cosmologist. Um, so what that means in practice, if you go to the next slide um, in my talk, is that we'll telescope some specialized telescopes um, in order to study the universe. Um, and uh, what that means in practice in real life is if you click to the third slide, um, Adrian, um, is that uh, on a day to day, my job, or, um, uh, I play with toys and I travel to weird places in order to do my job. Um, so it's pretty fun, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that today. Uh, so, next, next slide, please. Um, so, as a cosmologist, uh, the main thing I do is build telescopes, and what these telescopes do is measure light that's very faint. And so what that means is that we have to build our telescopes in special places in order to do our work. Um, so the, the picture at the very top of this slide shows the different types of light that are available out there in the world. 
And the light that most of us are familiar with is visible light that we can see with our own eyes. And so, of course, if you want to build a telescope that can see visible light, um, you have to go to somewhere with very dark skies. And so that's what one of the example pictures shows in the bottom in the purple box. Um, these are optical telescopes and they are you know, on a dark mountaintop where they can get a very clear view of the sky. Now, it turns out that for other types of light, they have different requirements for what kind of places you have to observe from. Um, so for a microwave type of light, uh, it turns out that water vapor in the atmosphere is a problem for our telescopes and messes with our observations. And so for microwave telescopes, we want them to be in very high locations and very dry locations. And so that's going to be featured in our discussions today um, because the South Pole is one of the driest deserts in the world. And that's why so many microwave telescopes operate from there. Um, I've also worked with radio telescopes um, for, my, for my research. And for that, we need to install radio telescopes in quiet locations that are away from, for example, radio stations and cell phone towers. And so the upshot is that um, th these types of telescopes are similar in that to get away from these typical, typical contaminants, um, most of the time you have to get away from civilization and uh, get away from people. Um, so you end up going to pretty bizarre places. Um, so just to set some broader context, um, if you go to the next slide, um, I will just give a you know, quick description of kind of the weird places I've worked in um, for my research. Um, so in the Northern Hemisphere, I've most recently been doing work in the Canadian High Arctic on Axel Heiberg Island. Um, so that's at nearly 80 degrees northern, uh, north latitude. And then if you click to the next slide um, to transition to the Southern Hemisphere, um, in the most recent past few years, I've been doing work on Marianne Island, which is halfway between South Africa and Antarctica. Um, that's a very radio quiet location. Um, I've also spent one summer working at McMurdo Station, which is on the coast of Antarctica uh, to launch a balloon borne telescope. And then of course, the South Pole is the focus of today's discussion uh, where I spent four summers working on a telescope and then one winter. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, I'll start off with um, a little bit of personal history, um, which is that uh, I started my work at the South Pole as a graduate student. Um, so this is dating me a little bit now, but back in 2005 to 2009, uh, those were the first summers that I spent at Pole. Um, and, and that's my, my precious baby. That's my thesis experiment in the picture. Uh, so that is bicep one that you see um, this big thing in the foreground. And if you look in the distant, in the distance on the horizon, uh, there's a rectangular structure that's kind of just on the horizon line, and that's the main station, and that's where we live and work. And it's about a 15-minute walk between uh, the telescope and the main station. So if you go to the next slide, um, this I'm just showing a couple of pictures of what it's like to work on this sort of equipment uh, as a student. Um, so as I mentioned briefly, a lot of the stuff that we do is um, all built of, uh, from scratch. Um, you can't go to the store and ask them to you know, uh, sell you a telescope to measure the earliest light from the universe. Um, so you have to make and build it yourself. Uh, so all these components that you see were lovingly put together by graduate students. Um, the picture on the left shows the, the mount for the telescope uh, with no telescope installed, uh, just humans at the moment. And then on the right hand side, you see uh, what seems to be now a very small telescope <laughs> that I put together for my PhD. Um, so that was putting the optics into the telescope itself. And if you go to the next slide, um, this picture shows um, the telescope being loaded into the mount on the left-hand side. And then once it's installed, you have to run it. And this particular system uh, was very thirsty. It required liquid helium and liquid nitrogen in order to run. And so that was my job to, um, to feed the beast uh, on occasion uh, with, uh, with the liquids that are in that huge container on the right-hand side. Um, so, so this is how I uh, started off my work at the South Pole um, as a PhD student. And if you click to the next slide, um, as a student, I always knew that um, I wanted to spend a winter at the South Pole at some point in my life. Um, it seemed you know, like a wonderful place and I wanted to you know, spend more time there. Um, so it took a few years before the stars aligned and I could really make that happen with my work and personal life. Um, but finally in 2012 that um, everything worked out and I was able and fortunate uh, to spend a winter with the South Pole Telescope. So I changed teams a little bit, and the um, SPT is the giant telescope that you can see on the left side of this picture, uh, to, the, to the left of those flags. Um, so um, I'm sure that uh, there will be other pictures showing uh, you know, um, depictions of winter uh, for, for today, um, but I'm just going to select a few to show you to, to kick off the discussion. Um, so if you click to the next slide, 
Um, so the winter season um, at the South Pole is um, it's isolated, and so there are, um, there is a last plane that leaves, and after that, uh, the station is completely cut off, and you're there with your teammates, and there are no planes that come in for um, the better part of a year. Uh, so for us, that is our last plane that was leaving on February 15th of 2012. And then there was not another plane that came by again until October 27th of that year. And so during that time, uh, there were 40 of us and uh, we just hung out and did our job. Um, so if you go to the next slide, um, I thought I would share some pictures of life at the South Pole that you won't find by Googling online or looking up at Wikipedia. Um, so on the left hand side, um, this is one of the realities of working in the dark sector. Uh, so that's where the telescopes live. Um, so to get from home to work, it's a 15 minute walk and we follow the flag line to get back uh, because you can see that sometimes the weather conditions are bad enough that it's pretty hard to, uh, to find your way around. Um, so we follow the flag lines like Hansel and Gretel fo following the crumbs and that's how we get back home safely uh, during the middle of the winter. And then of course, um, food is important when you're working. And so because it's cold outside, uh, it's a big refrigerator that we take uh, advantage of. So the picture on the upper right is the snack box that my fellow Winter Over and I set up. And so we put bits of frozen fruit in there to keep ourselves sane while we're out at the telescope. And then the bottom right picture is probably the silliest one that I have, uh, which is that when I wintered, um, there had not been another female Winter Over in the dark sector for the past decade or so. And the waste technicians were kind of freaking out about how to install a toilet um, because uh, there was a lady in the house and they couldn't just issue, give the standard issue funnel and bucket that they normally do for the men. Uh, so that is a picture of a block of pink foam that the waste technicians uh, lovingly gifted to me so I could carve my own toilet seat. Uh, so again, these are just uh, silly pictures that uh, you won't find by Googling online. Uh, so if you go to the next picture, um, I'll show you a few slides of just what um, the, the environment is like at Pole. Um, so we are blessed with one very long sunset um, that stretches out for you know, the better part of a day. And during that time, while the sun is near the horizon, you can see a really interesting um, a phenomenon as the light is just kind of flickering back and forth. And then if you go to the next slide, of course, one of the best aspects of working at the South Pole is all the southern lights that you see. And um, I, uh, I had to restrict myself to only one picture, um, but it really is magical. It's uh, one of the greatest things that you can see from down there. Uh, and if you click to the next slide, um, this is another winter phenomenon, which is that sometimes you see halos around the moon from ice crystals in the air. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's a really beautiful place to work. Um, so if you click to the next slide, um, in addition to beautiful things in the environment, um, there's also really bizarre stuff at the station. Um, so things that accumulate at the station don't really leave. Uh, so this is one of the odder things that's at the station. Uh, that is a frozen sturgeon that is buried in the ice tunnels. And it's been there since the 90s. And the legend of the sturgeon is written on those pieces of paper on the right hand side. Um, so then if you click to the next slide, um, back to uh, natural phenomenon, um, sunrise eventually does come back and you see long shadows as the light reappears. And if you click to the next slide, um, this is another one of these uh, oddball things you won't find from Googling online. Um, but when the first plane comes in, uh, one of the wonderful things is that they bring in fresh food, um, which we don't have for most of the year. Um, and so you will see in the sign in the, in the left-hand side that those are reserved for winter overs only um, because we've been deprived of such wonderful things for the year. And in the lower right-hand corner, you can see that one of my friends um, accidentally picked up the frozen broccoli first before I told him that there was fresh broccoli available. And you can do a compare and contrast and quiz yourself and guess which one was fresh and which one had been frozen for the year. Um, so uh, if you click to the next slide, um, you know, eventually winter ends and it's time to go home. So on November 13th, I left the station and that was my ride on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, you can see um, that's the back of the C-17 landing in New Zealand and bringing us back to civilization. Um, so um, I'll end there um, and I'll just, um, if you click to the next slide, I will preemptively answer one question that I frequently get about the South Pole, which is, are there penguins? And the answer is unfortunately no, except for the ones that you see in these pictures. Uh, so only stuffed penguins and people's costumes that they bring for various reasons. Um, but I just want to advertise that if you go to the next slide, that cosmology is pretty fun because even if you don't get to see penguins at the pole, um, there are penguins in many other locations where we 
we get to do our work. Um, so Marion Island, for example, has a lot of uh, king penguins floating around. And then McMurdo on the right, uh, that's another experiment that I worked on. And there are penguins cheering us on there as well. Um, so I think I will end there and I'll hand off back to Adrian. Thanks. OK, well, thank you very much, Cynthia. Um, we already have um, one question that kind of is a quick one that's directly related um, to what you said. Um, so you said that there were 40 um, other people. Was that just 40 for your experiment or is that 40 total? That was about 40 for the entire station. Uh, so for the SPT, it was myself and one other winter over and uh, we always work in pairs for that project. Uh, but it, it varies depending on which experiment you're talking about. Okay, great. Um, and um, McLean, if you want to take it away and give, um, give your little spiel. Sure. Yep, um, and you can share directly. Yes. Okay, seems to be on. <laughs> so hi, the, I got a bit of an introduction already from Adrian. Uh, my name is McLean Grubel. I'm a master's student. She's just submitted her thesis. I'm very happy about that. Um, at McGill University, I work in the McGill Cosmology Instrumentation Lab, uh, which is also where Josh works. Um, we work on, uh, as it sounds like, <laughs> cosmology and instrumentation and our main focus uh, is the South Pole Telescope, or SBT, which is where Cynthia was wintering, but not where she was working, but we like BICEP too. Um, so I'm the least experienced of the polies on, on the channel today. It was my first season down there this year. I was only down for a month during the summer, so I'm going to be bringing a little bit more of the freshman perspective of what it's like to be introduced to uh, working at the South Pole. So starting up north, where we usually live, um, my work in the lab is uh, and the subject of my thesis was on building and testing new types of amplifier systems for microwave telescopes like the South Pole Telescope. Uh, so here's this is a little picture of my setup on the desktop. Uh, it's a lot of hands-on stuff and like quite specialized. Like a lot of instrumentation development, um, I really focused in on one aspect of how a telescope works. So I was really excited to get down south and meet the whole telescope all together uh, in person and up close. Uh, so that's me. So SPT, uh, I won't give a huge introduction on this because I think Josh is going to give a little bit more depth, but this is a cosmology telescope using microwave light. So we need really dry locations like the South Pole. Uh, we look at the cosmic microwave background, which is radiation left over from very early days in the universe. Um, here's another view of the telescope here. This is from outside looking in at the lab buildings, which are out in the dark sector. So a little bit of a walk away from base. Uh, <laughs> there's no radio signals allowed out here, so you've got to be careful with your phone on, on uh, airplane mode all the time. No Bluetooth headphones was a mistake that was made a few times while I was down there. Um, so inside these lab buildings uh, is where a lot of the telescope operation takes place. And I spend a lot of time in here um, working and learning and uh, seeing all the parts of the telescope. For example, this is inside the base of the telescope. Uh, I was down there a lot to get the lay of the land kind of and how the telescope works in general, but also to learn how to do daily tasks uh, that might have to be done like maintenance and checking systems, keeping everything running smoothly over a winter uh, if I were to spend an upcoming season down there uh, with just one other person working on the telescope. Uh, that was really fun for me because like my work up north, this uh, it's really hands-on. So this is <laughs> climbing up inside the telescope receiver itself, uh, looking at all the hardware, getting a really good picture of how this telescope works as a unit all together, and not just the really specialized part that I usually touch. Um, so here you can, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, but I've labeled them. You can see some mirrors. You can see the aperture, which is where the light is actually coming in. It's a telescope from outside. Um, big metal can in the middle is where the detectors live, and systems like what I usually work on are all sealed up in there. Uh, and then all the warm electronics down at the bottom is what processes the signals coming out. Uh, we also spent quite a bit of time, not just inside the telescope, but on top of the telescope. So this is now looking down into that cabin where the last picture was. Um, we're here, we're installing the Event Horizon Telescope camera, which is the famously took a picture of a black hole a couple of years ago. Very exciting. SBT works as one of the antennas for that experiment. So and it, OK. 
Okay, I think we have a slight lag with McLean's um, video here. So we'll just wait a few seconds to see if she comes back. Well, while we wait, um, let me ask um, uh, a question that has been submitted that I think was probably um, uh, inspired, Cynthia, by your, um, by your diagram of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and so one question that has come through, um, if I can paraphrase it a little bit, is, um, is it possible to see gamma rays um, from, from the South Pole? I'm muted now. Uh, so thanks for that question. Uh, so no, um, so uh, the so we live in the Earth's atmosphere and um, different types of light. Uh, so some some kinds kinds of light are able to come through and some kinds of light are blocked. And so gamma rays are blocked by the Earth's atmosphere. And that's a good thing um, because then they don't cause damage to your skin as you're sitting down here. Um, so the upshot is that if you want to observe very high energy light like that, you typically have to go to space and use a satellite instead. So the South Pole does not work for gamma ray observation. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, McLean, you're back. Hi. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you um, think that like we fame the South Pole for having very poor internet access, but apparently my house does too. So <laughs> hopefully that won't happen again. Um, right. But I can reshare. Yeah. Yep. Sure. I think uh, I think I got to about here last time, so I'll pick up from here. Um, so you're not sharing right now. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess that would be good. Better. Yep, that's better. All right. So um, I think before I got cut off, I was just talking about sharing uh, experiments and exploring all this different, this really cool science that's going on down there. There's such a range of experiments that happen at the South Pole. Like this is an example of the new BICEP array, which is another telescope that's uh, neighboring to SBT. So we got to take a tour inside, see the mount, see the outside. Uh, they had cookies, which was great. Um, but there's other experiments around, uh, and everyone really helps everyone, which is why it's important to get along with your coworkers. So <laughs> you're in really close quarters all the time. This is me and my uh, one of our current winter overs uh, down at SPT, Allen. Uh, we spend a lot of time working closely together, and it's important to also be able to relax so that you don't get on each other's nerves for sure. <laughs> this is those all on our way back to base. Um, of course, there's this really good sense of community at the station too. Lots of jokes, lots of puns, uh, which I'm a big fan of here. This is Space Odyssey reference it made me laugh every time I walk through those doors. Uh, <laughs> there, this also was another odd example of the community uh, down there. Even over the summer, I think people get a little wacky. The uh, one of our Roombas, which are really pets more than cleaning devices, I think, went missing for about a week, and people built a shrine to him in the hopes that he would be returned. Um, he was, and was greeted by the other Roomba on the floor. So some of the eccentricities of uh, station life. <laughs> for me, my biggest challenge, uh, certainly for the first week, was figuring out what to wear when I went outside. Uh, I've never been to some place that is as cold or as bright or as dry as that. And so I iterated my outfit uh, pretty much daily until I found <laughs> the, the right settings. Starting off with, on the top left, what I had been wearing at McMurdo Station on the coast, which was nowhere near warm enough and the glasses really fogged up, then all the way down to becoming comfortable going out for short walks without my face covered. Just took a lot of time. <laughs> but if you were well prepared, certainly rewarding to spend time outside. Uh, really nice. The scenery is amazing. It's a, such a unique view around. Uh, you can see forever when it's clear. Uh, this is a view of the South Pole Telescope and the next door uh, bicep telescope uh, on a nice clear day. That's not always the case. Sometimes it is quite cloudy, <laughs> but overall uh, a very good adventure. Um, of course, no penguins, like Cynthia said, at the pole, but penguins at McMurdo Station, which was very rewarding on the way back north. Um, yeah, and that's my brief introduction. Thanks from the 2020 team. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, McLean. Um, that was very nice. And um, one question that um, we, we actually have um, here is, uh, 
after this? Um, are you more enthusiastic, less enthusiastic about wintering over? What, what's your take? Uh, hmm, I guess more based on, because I've seen the place now, whereas before I, when I applied to winter this past year, uh, I hadn't seen the, <laughs> the station at all. Uh, and so now having seen it and having reassured myself that it is actually in fact quite comfortable, uh, that seems like a realistic prospect. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thank you. Um, Josh, let's move on to you before we uh, pivot over to just the general Q&A session. I'm going to unmute you now. Sweet. All righty. Let me share the screen. All right. Um, hi, uh, my name is Joshua. Um, I am a graduate student working in the Dobbs lab at McGill Cosmology Institute, uh, um, just like McLean. And I began in 2012 here. And I've done like three and a half summers at Pole. And uh, in 2018, I did a winter season as well. So um, this is a picture of the winter over crew from 2018. Uh, I'm all the way here in the left. Um, and uh, let's see, I mean, there's, there's a lot to talk about, um, but uh, I'm just going to go through a couple of pictures here and, and hit a couple of things on the way. So McLean mentioned that um, uh, full telescope played a role in the Event Horizon Telescope uh, observing campaign. Um, so you guys might remember the, this image of the black hole. Uh, this is a synthesized image um, taken with an uh, interferometer that used uh, telescopes all over the world. Um, and the South Pole Telescope uh, forms one of those antennas for two weeks out of the year. Uh, and so the, the pictures that you saw with McLean installing the second uh, receiver in there uh, have to happen in winter, uh, where the uh, observing for the South Pole Telescope pauses. Um, and then the winter rovers install two sets of optics basically on top of the South Pole Telescope, diverting the light, uh, and then observe as part of the campaign with the worldwide collaboration of the Event Horizon Telescope um, for a few weeks, uh, and then disassemble all of that and go back to regular observing. Uh, and so I know we had a, a question or two about sort of what the winter over activities are. I think that's one of the more uh, unique uh, winter over activities that, that stretch beyond um, sort of the dealing with emergencies that come up or maintenance or, or uh, sort of managing the station. Um, there's this, this uh, brief period where uh, a lot of activity has to happen to basically recommission and recalibrate a whole other instrument. Um, this is one of my favorite night sky pictures. Uh, so looking at the sky from pole in the winter is kind of unique because um, Compared to say the middle of the woods somewhere in North America, it, it actually doesn't get that dark. Um, when, if you're somewhere where there's actually relatively low light pollution in North America, uh, because you are so far below the, the pole, um, the sun stays quite far away from the horizon. When the sun sets, it, it travels a lot farther behind the earth. And so the sky gets pitch black. And that's never quite true at, at pole. The, the sun is never more than a dozen or so degrees below the horizon. Um, and so the, the sky always has kind of a bluish tinge to it, even if you let your eyes kind of adjust. Uh, but nevertheless, because there is such little light pollution and because the, the, it's so cold and, uh, and dry, um, the optical quality of what you're looking through is just incredible. And so even though you don't necessarily see more light because it is dark, you see much more of the sky just because it's so clear. And it's hard to kind of capture what that clarity feels like. It was totally unexpected. I think the, the closest thing that, you know, I, I get it, it, it feels like somebody's just ripped the whole uh, ceiling off of the world. Um, and, and everything that kind of, you could look throughout the atmosphere here and you can see that the stars and the celestial sphere is really far away. There, it feels like it's right there. Like you can reach out and touch it. Um, uh, that was taken a couple of days um, after we hit this milestone, which was uh, our first minus 100 uh, day, uh, which was um, in, in July. And you can see with wind chill, uh, even with 11 knot winds, which is, is not that much, it, it, it really kicks it up a notch. And so because it's so dry there, um, 
the, it takes a lot of time for heat to leave your body if there's no wind. Uh, and so even in weather that is you know, almost uh, minus 100 Fahrenheit or minus 50 or 60 centigrade, uh, you can be outside in t-shirt and a jeans for a couple of minutes before it really, you have to come inside as long as there's no wind. Um, but as soon as there's any wind, uh, then it becomes dangerous. Uh, and so that's when you have these, these incredible layers you have to put on and, and protect any exposed skin. Uh, we are, our, our um, sort of station manager at the time was fond of saying that uh, the South Pole, uh, people at the South Pole are the most isolated people uh, in history. Um, and, and I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, but his, uh, his selling point was that even the astronauts, if they want to go home, they can push a button and be home in, you know, six hours. Uh, and at Pole, there have been a couple of winter medevacs and sort of rescues, but for the most part, you know, you're there for the long haul. Uh, and communication, you know, we, we don't have much of it. So uh, there's always Iridium satellite uh, links that sometimes work for phone calls. Um, but uh, oftentimes you only get an hour or a couple hours of internet a day. At, uh, at the best, you get blocks of six hours a day. And uh, here's sort of a an example of what your, your satellite path would be, where these are brief windows where a satellite is above the horizon, we can see it uh, and, and get internet. And SPITTER, which is the, the telescope or the satellite at the bottom here, um, provides somewhere around like, like early 2000s DSL speeds shared amongst the 40 people on station. Uh, so it's enough to load web pages, but not enough to do much more than that. Uh, I get a lot of questions about what the living area was like. Um, so if you've ever lived on a boat, it's uh, kind of similar to that. Uh, your, your dorm rooms are pretty narrow. You've got a hallway, a bed, a desk. Uh, and these walls are all thin sort of temporary dividers. Um, and so oftentimes, if the person to the left of you sneezes, the person to the right of you says is in tight. Uh, but uh, you don't really need a whole lot of space because pretty soon the entire station kind of becomes your room. Uh, and, you know, outside the station, we're, we're really lucky as part of the science teams. Uh, we get to commute to work uh, every day, go to the telescope, take a walk, get out of the, out of the kind of clustery uh, uh, dorm room feel of the station. Uh, uh, also, a lot, of, a lot of comments on the food. I mean, so we have a couple of really uh, special events uh, and the, 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 um, the team down there that, that does the cooking are really fantastic. Uh, and you know, we range from, you know, these, these incredible chef quality meals, uh, but, you know, pretty soon you start running out of ingredients. You, you're, we have a small greenhouse, um, but it doesn't provide much. And uh, by the end of the year, it starts looking a little bit more like this. Uh, which is why when those fresh fruits and vegetables show up, it, it is only for winter over. Uh, I also kept myself to only one Aurora picture. Um, but, uh, you know, most of the time when you see Aurora pictures, it, it doesn't really reflect what you see with your own eyes, um, just because cameras are so much better at picking up on that light than, uh, than our eyes are uh, and collecting it. And it doesn't take that much longer of an exposure to, to make really, really strong uh, Aurora pictures. This was the one day, um, my winter where uh, I didn't have to use a long exposure in this camera. Um, this is brighter than what you would see with your eye, but not a whole lot much brighter. You can see up here, this bright, dot, bright uh, dot in the sky is actually Mars. Um, and uh, yeah, you got used to seeing, looking up in the sky and being able to immediately pick out Mars and the large and small Magellanic clouds. These features were just you know, right there in your face. Uh, and then I, I figured I, I'd, I'd leave on this last picture, uh, which is uh, sunrise. So it, it's true that sunset and sunrise uh, take about a day in, in, in the very last phase where it, it, it drops below the horizon and you can't see it. But we get um, two or three weeks of, of just wild colors as the sun actually gets low on the horizon and then comes back up. Uh, and this is taken from the top of the uh, NOAA observing tower. Um, which uh, is a hundred meter climb up some stairs, and and uh, because it's just so flat, you know, you really can't see for forever around you. And that's all I got. Um, so I'm look forward to answering any questions you might have. Great. Um, well, thank you very much, Josh. So we have 
just gotten a whole avalanche of questions. Um, and so I think the first one I'm actually going to direct towards you, Josh, because you had mentioned that um, the internet speeds are kind of good enough to load web pages, but not maybe to stream video or anything like that. And so one question we've gotten here is, so you're collecting all this data. How do you get these huge data sets off of Antarctica? Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I, should, uh, I should caveat my original statement which is that um, most of the broadband, uh, most of the bandwidth that we have at the South Pole goes towards science. Uh, you know, the, the primary reason why we're all down there is to do science and to support science. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the spinner satellite that I mentioned is actually uh, quite capable, but almost all of that bandwidth goes to getting science data off. We move about 200 gigabytes a day um, off of uh, Antarctica or off the South Pole back north. Uh, we are about, uh, we're one of the two experiments that uses the most bandwidth there. Even so, most of the data that we take uh, sits on, on uh, uh, disk drives and is only carried north in suitcases at the end of the year. So we downsample and we do data reduction and we push enough north to be able to be paying attention and, and doing quality checks and start doing preliminary science. Uh, but it's not until the end of the season when we get to carry all of those hard drives north, um, that we really get to uh, uh, do our analysis with the full data set. And that's a situation that is only going to continue. Um, you know, this was the, the first year where that was, or the first experiment generation where that was true. Previously, we were able to get all of our data off. And the next generation of experiments, it's going to be even more true. We'll have to be even more clever about uh, data reduction. Great, thank you. Um, so next question, which I'll, leave open to any of our panelists who want to answer it is uh, what happens if there is a medical issue uh, both in the summer or the winter do you have like uh, a staff of doctors on site or, or what what happens uh sophia did you have a medevac your season you could take this one i, I think that's true right oh uh, no no we, we thankfully did not have a medevac <laughs> So I think Cynthia might be a little bandwidth limited. McCoy, yeah. you want to say something? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, so we also didn't have any medevacs while, uh, is that true? Yeah, while I was there, thankfully. Um, but there is a station doctor and a nurse practitioner who are on site um, for the whole season, for the winter and the summer. Uh, there might be a slightly expanded medical staff in the summer, um, but they're within the crew who stay for the winter, there's also a team who train to be sort of an emergency medical response uh, of just regular station personnel who, uh, I trained for this actually when I was supposed to go down, and I think Josh, you did as well, um, which was sort of just a fast response um, just to make sure everybody's safe. Uh, that also applies for a fire team. So there's a similar tra mm. uh, trained team of volunteer firefighters amongst the regular station crew who train to respond to emergencies quickly. This, the base is pretty spread out. And so when things happen, they could happen anywhere and you need to be able to respond to them quickly. Um, especially for the winter, there's pretty stringent medical screenings that go as well. So that they make sure you know, you're not gonna get gallstones or something in July. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, yeah, gallstones would be bad. <laughs> yeah. um, all right, uh, next question we have here is, um, what do you, is it, um, is it all just, you know, wake up, work, 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 or do you get to explore a little bit? Like how, what's, what's the kind of daily schedule? Like if you wanted to say, go for a walk and see more of Antarctica, do you do that? Or, um, I think you're muted, Josh. Uh, I, I can feel this one, I suppose. Um, okay. Uh, can you can you still hear me okay? Yeah, maybe you can turn off your video, Cynthia. Um, probably... Okay, yeah, that might help a little bit. Okay, yeah, go for it, Cynthia. Well, you might have to, okay, great. Yeah. Is that a little bit better? Okay, yes. yeah, uh, so uh, for, for winter operations, um, yeah, if, 
uh, as, as the saying goes, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So if, um, if things are working well with the telescope, um, then there's actually quite a bit of free time during the days um, to you know, pick up your favorite hobbies. And you, know, you can walk around a little bit, uh, but it's not recommended that you come to the station. Um, but there are places to explore. Um, so the picture of the sturgeon that I showed, for example, uh, that lives in a network of ice tunnels that run underneath the station. And so that's a, um, a common place for people to kind of go, uh, I don't know, ice spelunking, I suppose. And uh, um, in addition to the sturgeon, there's um, a lot of other kind of bizarre little memorials that people have carved into the ice. Um, so that's one example of, you know, a place to check out um, as a tourist on station. Um, and then, you know, there are other days where things do break and things don't go as well as expected. And so then, you know, the work does ramp up during those periods. Um, but, you know, by and large, when everything is running smoothly, uh, there is quite a bit of free time on your hands. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a great segue into our next question, which um, the questioner would like to pose to all three of you. Um, and if I can paraphrase it a little bit, um, are there any particularly memorable kind of last minute unexpected emergency things you had to do? Um, maybe breakdowns of various machines or something like that? Um, and you know, how did you meet that challenge or what was it like? Maybe we can have Josh go first. Yeah, I got it. There you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, every every winter, uh, there is at least one or two things that that uh, goes wrong. Uh, and, um, you know, there's a running joke that every winter we, we have to almost burn down DSL at least once. Uh, oftentimes, the problem stems from the fact that, um, you know, you have some this mix of incredibly sensitive uh, uh, electronics trying to play well with uh, incredibly high power uh, electronics, um, such as the, the electronics that control the telescope motion uh, and that control the motors. Um, and both of these things are operating in environments that they are not meant to operate in and do so for longer than their usual service life. Uh, I think one of the best examples of this is that uh, one of the mounts that's being reused uh, for telescopes, uh, for several generations of telescopes, was originally designed uh, to do one rotation every day. Uh, and the observing strategy has changed since then, such that now the, the best way for the telescope to observe is to scan back and forth really fast. And it scans back and forth thousands of times a day. And so you design something to do one thing, it gets repurposed to do another, and uh, bearings crack, uh, uh, helium leaks. Uh, and significant repairs often end up having to be done over the winter. Um, yeah, I, I, I bet Cynthia's got at least one from from uh, her winter as well. Uh, I think a, a lot of times it's it's an electronics issue that you know gets uh, takes down the telescope, and you know you're either having to debug things with an oscilloscope or with uh, 240 volt power, and you know you use your machinist and uh, the electricians and these resources around you uh, that are that are pretty invaluable. Right, um, Cynthia, I think you got tagged there by by Josh. <laughs> Uh, sure. Uh, so yeah, every winter has its own ups and downs. And I think for our winter, we were relatively lucky in that we didn't have any major breakages of the telescope. Um, so, you know, there were minor components that failed here and there. And uh, so I had to do things like uh, swap heaters in the cabin and replace broken relays and, um, you know, uh, dealt with three phase power for the first time in my life. And uh, that was a fun and exciting experience um, as not a trained electrician. Um, but uh, things like that, you um, you know, you just kind of roll with it <laughs> when it when it happens. It's uh, you have your team members back up north uh, to help you out, and they're always on call. Uh, so I think uh, the most important thing in those situations is just to keep a level head and keep the lines of communication clear. And um, you know, that's the great part of working in a team like the South Pole Telescope is that everybody is always on standby and ready to help. Um, so even though you are isolated at the bottom of the world, uh, you're never really alone when it comes to troubleshooting and fixing things. McLean, anything to, to add? Perfect. Okay. 
so I didn't, I was only down during the summer and telescope ran pretty smoothly while I was there. The station did have a bit of a, an, <laughs> an issue during a maintenance operation, which ended up affecting all of us. Um, they do regularly scheduled maintenance on the water supply, which is done by boring a hole into the ice and, you know, melting water. Um, at one point the pump got stuck in the hole and so we had we were the station went on water restrictions and they had to call in all the people who usually are moving snow away from buildings to move snow towards the thing to melt snow so we'd have uh, water to drink and there, you know we there was talk of forming a bucket line to bring snow in to, <laughs> for melting and we all kind of came together and thankfully it was only about eight days that we had to skip showers okay <laughs> um I'm going to direct, I'm going to bundle a whole bunch of questions uh, into one, but this one I'm going to uh, um, have you know, direct to Cynthia as the, as the professor on the panel. Um, <laughs> is it, um, are there ever um, undergraduates who get to go to the South Pole? Um, are, and is it, uh, is it possible slash easy to join research groups that do South Pole work, you know, as, as, as a potential MSc or a PhD candidate? And also related to that, are there ways that citizen scientists can contribute to this sort of work? Oh, wow, that, that's quite a bundle all in one. So yeah. I'll try to keep that straight in my head. Uh, so first of all, a great question about undergraduates. Um, and Thankfully, the answer is yes. Uh, so actually, when I wintered, uh, my fellow winter over on SBT had just finished his undergraduate degree. Um, and so he was on the very young end of the spectrum. Um, but because he had you know, gotten into lab work very early, um, he was you know, very talented. And uh, I knew that we would work together well as a team. And so yeah, he was brought onto the project uh, just fresh out of undergrad. And I know that uh, for other uh, positions on the station, not necessarily telescope related, um, there are younger people who have wintered before. Uh, so yeah, by all means, it, it's open to, uh, to anyone who is interested and qualified. Uh, then as for graduate studies, um, uh, yeah, there are a number of projects that um, happen at the South Pole. So uh, right now the current telescope count is three, I believe. And there are other experiments that run as well. So the largest one is IceCube, and that's a particle physics experiment uh, that is a, you know, a big detector that is buried in the ice. Um, and so that is a huge project, and there's a lot of students working on that. Um, so all of these projects are fairly large collaborations, and there's a lot of room for, um, it, it, it's really the students who make these all work. Uh, so yes, there are opportunities to join for MSc and PhD. And then, um, well, the question about citizen science, I think uh, my knowledge is a little bit dated, so I might tag in Josh and McLean for this one. Um, but as of when, when I was doing my work down there uh, for, the, for the experiments I was on in particular, uh, there was not so much citizen science involvement, um, but maybe that's changed with things like the EHT. Um, so that, that's a question that I'll toss off to the other guys. Uh... Yeah, so I, I guess there's two things uh, that I will take. I'm going to take this question in two different directions. Um, for citizen science, there is not much in the way of citizen science in the same way that there exists for like uh, the SDSS Zooniverse type stuff. Um, so there are a lot of opportunities uh, for like untrained uh, citizen scientists to make a huge impact um, in science that categorizes or that tries to understand large data volumes, um, uh, such as in the Zooniverse project. Uh, that doesn't really fit for a lot of the science that happens at the South Pole. Um, for the IceCube experiment, the neutrino experiment, uh, the data processing is fairly abstract. So they have a huge data volume, but it can't really be easily represented in a way that uh, humans, uh, trained or untrained, can, can make a lot of headway in. Uh, and the same thing for, for SPT. Uh, I would say that there's a lot of possibilities uh, to participate in outreach, um, although less for the astrophysics experiments and more for the NOAA and climate science experiments uh, that do spend a lot of time trying to reach out to uh, the public based on the, the experiments and activities they do there. And then the other thing that I wanted to mention is that, um, yeah, I think a lot of the winter rovers that we have uh, that have been in very successful winter rovers for the South Pole Telescope 
um, have been undergraduates uh, the, the year after they graduate. Um, and so in order to be you know, qualified for a winter over position, it's actually, uh, Cynthia and I are, are kind of rare in the sense that it's not that often that somebody who has worked in the collaboration or worked on at the South Pole uh, ends up being the winter over. It's far more common for somebody who has a background in STEM uh, and an interest in doing a combination of computing and hands-on stuff um, to just uh, apply for the position uh, and deploy as a winter rover uh, in the year between being an, an undergrad and applying for graduate school uh, or not applying for graduate school. Um, and as of this week, the positions opened uh, for the South Pole Telescope winter rover position next year. So we're looking for two people for the next winter season. Uh, and anybody who is interested in doing that uh, can find uh, the job uh, uh, application on the University of Chicago webpage, and I can post a link here in the in the chat when we're done. So I, I would encourage you all, uh, if this is, in, is interesting to you, to come join us. Um, let me direct the next question to to McLean to 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 start off, um, and then the other two. You know, Josh and Cynthia can, can chime in if you want. Um, I think you, McLean, already you already said that you'd be willing, certainly, definitely open to going again. Um, was there anything you wish you had brought with you that you didn't? Yeah. Ah, perfect. Uh, good question. Wait, that I brought with you that I wish I didn't, or that I no, did no, not that, that you wish you had brought with you. Okay, that I did not bring. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Uh, why? So I didn't pack to spend the winter, thankfully, because I knew I was only going for a month or so. It would have been a lot of extra baggage to drag down just for a few weeks. Um, I think actually I brought way too much stuff uh, I, that I probably could have been fine for a year with what I brought. <laughs> I wasn't prepared for how comfortable uh, life would already be down there with the one exception that I did not bring uh, a PlayStation or something down with me. <laughs> and I totally would <laughs> for the winter. Um, yeah, I definitely was way over prepared. <laughs> okay. Cynthia, Josh, anything you really should have brought with you that you didn't? Uh, I guess I can go. Um, I, I'll echo McLean's sentiment is that yeah, life at the station is pretty comfortable. Um, so before I wintered, I had spent four summers working on station and every year um, I progressively packed less and less um, because they really do have everything there. Um, and uh, yeah, and then also for my winter, I also bribed a bunch of my friends to send me care packages. And so I ended up uh, not having to uh, pack that much for myself and then uh, rationed those care packages throughout the year. So I always had surprises as the months went by. Um, but yeah, people do tend to um, overpack things. And so that's why there is so much random stuff that ends up at the station. Um, so as an example, I think there is a closet that is full of nothing but wigs and Halloween costumes. Yes. And, you know, so, so weird stuff ends up there. Okay. Um, we are actually getting towards the end of the hour. So I'm just going to do um, a uh, a bit of a rapid fire one real quick. Um, so just yes or no, um, this is a question that was submitted in advance. Were you warm enough with all the gear you were provided? Oh my God, too yeah. warm. Yes. Too warm? <laughs> too warm. Yeah. Yeah. Too okay. Warm. <laughs> and Josh is nodding. His... <laughs> okay, so that, that checked off. Um, so we also, um, maybe let me bundle two questions together. Um, one is about, um, this one of the some of the science projects you've worked on on things that have come out of South Pole observations um, and perhaps whether there were other science projects from other scientists that you met down there perhaps uh, climate change observations or anything like that um, and also a very specific one are telescopes like um, SPT involved with measurements of the Hubble constant so a whole bunch of sciencey questions there. Um, uh, there's a lot of atmospheric monitoring that goes on um so that there's a whole like josh mentioned the noaa people uh, they launch daily weather balloons to monitor uh atmospheric conditions so there's a whole contingent of people down there working on that um i don't know a whole lot of 
about all the things that happened, but I do know that my very last day there, speaking of climate change, we set, uh, we blew away the temperature record, a high temperature record for that day. We hit minus 22 C, which is, I mean, t-shirt weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and for the Hubble constant, um, uh, Yes, although probably not in the way that you're imagining. Um, so oftentimes when we think about measuring the Hubble constant, we imagine accumulating uh, standard ladders and standard candles uh, and trying to get a, a distance measurement to things that we can then measure how quickly are receding from us. Um, in contrast, the science that we're doing is trying to understand uh, the composition of the universe and the evolution of that universe. And so we have a, a measurement of the very early universe and we can play that tape forward and compare that to the universe now. And that is actually giving us another indirect measurement of the Hubble constant. So uh, the Hubble constant is a pretty significant output of the science that's done with the cosmic microwave background and the science that we do. Um, but it, it indirectly, because it, it defines much of the evolutionary history of the universe. Cynthia, anything to add? Uh, no, just that, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty fun to be able to interact with all the other um, varieties of science groups there. Um, it is one of the nice aspects of field work um, that, you know, when we're working at a university, we typically stay within our own research groups and it's quite insular in that regard. Um, and poll is nice because uh, you, you know, for it, it's a great thing to be kind of forced to interact with um, everyone else who's doing research in all sorts of different areas. And so I, I'd spent more time hanging out with like the ice cube people and learning about particle detectors than I would ever normally do in my real life. So, uh, so yeah, it's a great opportunity to um, learn about other people's work. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you very much to, to our three panelists today for sharing their experiences. Um, if you um, open up the chat, um, I will have copy and pasted um, a link that Josh has provided for us for anyone who wants to see the ad for um, someone to winter over um, at the South Pole on the job ad. Um, I will um, also say that I, we sincerely apologize if given time constraints, we were not able to get to your question. Um, but uh, if you do have burning questions you wanna ask us or any of the panelists, um, I have just put our physics outreach email in the chat as well. You can feel free to email us and we can um, direct those along. Um, and as a final um, little bit of an ad, if I may uh, just share my screen for a brief second. Um, Coming up in um, about two weeks, we've got our next um, live stream uh, talk. This one will be a little bit less of a panel discussion, although um, we'll of course take a lot of questions as well. Um, this one is gonna be led by uh, Leah Formenti, um, who is a student in our uh, McGill physics department. She is gonna talk about particle accelerators. I'm using giant machines to smash uh, tiny particles together. Um, this will be advertised on Twitter, on our um, on our Facebook feed. So um, if you have questions ahead of time, um, you can submit them or also just come along to the event and um, paste your questions in the chat. Um, and we hope to see you there. Um, so thank you everyone for attending. Thank you panelists again for uh, calling in. Um, and with that, we hope to see you in two weeks. Thank you. Thanks Adrian. Thanks everyone else.